there's drains going on in the silver supply and you're seeing metal come off of the SL. So someone's somebody's wants the physical silver for whatever reason. And, you know, there's a huge arbitrage. You take a silver brick of thousand ounces and you turn it into 10 ounce bars, hundred ounce bars, one ounce coins, the retail markup on that silver product that's made out of silver is huge. So, you know, there's a lot of incentive to put out more product that the retail investor wants and there's a ready market for it. So that could be part of the equation. The rest is industrial demand really hasn't subsided, especially with what's going on in the energy sphere with um, Europe being, you know, in dire straits with the amount of energy that they need and the amount they're actually able to produce. So they're dependent on you know, Russia and alternative means of heat like wood. And that, of course, um, goes into the alternative energy, which is solar primarily and wind power, as we all know. And of course, that means there's a, you know, a non-ceasing demand for solar at the present time, and that's probably going to increase. So we have a lot of vectors that point to silver for a variety of reasons, and we do see the drainage continuing. I do have to point out that Many silver advocates over years and years have said again and again that, you know, there's this much silver that's in the uh, delivery month and there's this many contracts for the delivery month and presto change, oh, it's going to happen this month. And it never does. And the reason it doesn't is because most of those contracts are professionals and they do what's called a rollover. So they roll over from the delivery month of December into the next delivery month, which is March. And there's advocates that, you know, have a pretty good reputation, but they get it wrong. And I'm not saying it couldn't happen. In theory, it could happen. The other thing is they get excited about when you get past first notice day and you get into the final delivery day. And I have from personal experience, because I have taken metal off exchange. Not a lot of these people that comment on it haven't really done what I've done in the industry. And I got kind of behind the eight ball one time, Elijah. I had um, not closed out my contract. It was past the final lose day, and I was kind of sweating it. I've had the money to take it if I needed to. But my broker said, oh, no, he's very casual. He's mad, don't worry about it. <laughs> we can still you know, fix it by you buying the contract. Don't worry about it. And I did. But it kind of gave me a lesson in real life, the wheel exchange, how it really works. And uh, I'm not saying it happens in all cases, but there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that most people aren't aware of. And um, very little of that metal is delivered versus the amount of paper that is pushed back and forth every day. You got to remember that during the trading day, there might be a big trading house that's in and out of the market 10 times. They might be long three times and short seven times during the same day. I mean, there's, it's, a, it's a big casino. If, the algorithms work for you. You're making money almost every day. But we look at, you know, the commitment of traders, and it's important. You get kind of a big picture of you doing that. Looking at the warehouse inventory is always important. You get another good clue of what's going on in the physical silver market, which is key. But nonetheless, there are subtleties that i say some of the market participants overreact to and make too much of a big deal about. We have a viewer's question here about um, kind of the COMEX inventories and also the, the price of silver, how it's rising right now after after this low. They ask, could a bank just drain the COMEX at a low, at a low spot price? And then when COMEX is, uh, has a low inventory and the spot price goes up a bit, as we've already seen, then sell it back to the COMEX and then kind of profit from that and rinse and repeat your perspective on that. Oh, yeah, it can do be done all the time. I mean, silver was in a flat mode for 20 years. I mean, from basically 1981 until 2003, silver just hovered around $5 an ounce and you can make really good money by what's called selling puts. Uh, you can look it up on the internet what selling a put means, but basically you're just betting that silver is going to stay at five bucks, maybe not move up. So yeah, there's lots of ways to do it. Most of the time um, for the questioner, it's done synthetically. It's done with paper. But yes, you could do it physically, you bet. 
Now, I did want to get your perspective kind of going into the end of the year here and looking to 2023. We are seeing the Fed move slightly from its hawkish stance. It seems like, you know, we're they're slowing the rate hikes. We just got a couple days ago uh, news that the Fed, you know, is going to ha- has raised uh, rates half a point instead of, you know, the three quarters of a point it had been uh, uh, raising in the recent recent uh, past year. So do you think that Fed, do you think that's a pivot? And how do you think that is going to impact metals in 2023? I don't think it's going to have a large effect. It does always have an effect when it's announced. Sort of a knee-jerk reaction and people, you know, make a big fuss about it. And it gets in the financial press for about three days and then it's ignored until the next time they raise or don't raise. I, they're in a bind. I don't think they can uh, stop raising rates until they put in a new system. They may, they may pivot. Powell's been pretty adamant that they haven't even thought about changing the inflation two uh, percent mark that they continually talk about he may change that to four percent in the next the half year next you know maybe by june of 2023 they say well continuing to raise rates and now we're up to you know five and a half percent and inflation's it's come down to six percent we're targeting four now instead of two and once we achieve that then you know, they may pivot but i think a pivot is going to send a message to the markets that the Federal Reserve is giving up on making the dollar worth anything. And it really signals to the market the dollar's worthless because that's a point where they just keep printing even more. We've printed so much already and it's an exponential function. So we're at a point where at some place in time, the markets say, this is just funny money. It's not really gonna be worth anything. I'm getting out of it. I'm going to buy you know, lumber, coal, wheat, whatever I can get for these dollars because I don't trust them anymore. They're not going to be worth very much in the near future. Haven't reached that point yet. Dollar is coveted right now. It's needed by our foreign trading partners. They are very much in need of dollars and that will continue until it doesn't. So it's a complex system, but it isn't so complex that the basics don't apply. And when you have too much of something, it's less valuable. Right now, the reason we don't have too many dollars, although we printed so much, is because the trading partners needed to settle their debts. And they are in uh, insolvent in a lot of cases. So in order to remain in business, they have to borrow more money. So what they do is they print up their currency, Swiss francs, for example, and send it over to a swap line with the Federal Reserve and get dollars for it to solve their dollar problem. But it's all a big shell game back and forth, and we're getting near the end of it. You know, at some point, the street vendor that has the shell game going on has, I guess, the end of the day, he packs up his works, he moves on. That's a metaphor for where we're headed.